thank you for having me and I'm happy um to talk with any of you guys because sometimes you need that but we can all do it you can do it like I am just the same as you guys so we can do it you just you can get there Thanks for logging in. We might, we might get right into it. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, so yeah, really want to wish everyone a warm welcome to, and it's, this is a special episode of Anesthesia Coffee Break, as well as Adrenaline Memories. Um, and it's really about <laughs> in the Mount Everest challenge, being a mum getting through this first part exam. And you know, just being, being a person who's not a mum at all, I, I cannot imagine how hard it is because I know how hard people have to work just at being a mum in, in itself without actually sitting this exam. So what I thought we'd do is, you know, this is a really open discussion. Um, please post any questions in the chat. We're going to be talking to one of our trainees who's passed the exam and is a mum as well. Um, and I thought what we'd go through is a bit of background, um, kind of try to find out what the main issues are, and then really get on to asking, you know, the audience and uh, particular trainee Sarah about her experience, you know, her background, anesthesia training, her experience of being a mum and doing the first part exam the challenges, the resources and supports that are out there and, you know, what you'd potentially like as solutions and kind of supports that would be really great into the future. So I might just put it over to Stan, but, you know, Stan, it was, it was so good that you, this came to you, that this was a really important thing to talk about, um, especially because you're right at the forefront of trying to give as much education out there as possible. So yeah, Stan, over to you. Thanks, La. And look, this topic is especially dear to my heart. It makes me very emotional, actually. Um, you know, myself being a father of three kids and understanding the sacrifices that my wife has had to make uh, to support my career. And I can only imagine how difficult it is for you mums out there, you know, having to be in that role to support your families and to also be able to advance your careers as well. And, you know, for that, I think you guys are absolutely amazing. Um, and, you know, being a mother, as I said uh, in the post, just requires unrequited love, dedication and sacrifice. And, you know, those are all those things that, um, you know, I talk about for the primary exam. That's what it takes to pass. But the thing is, you know, for us, it's easy enough without families, without children to say that. And, you know, I set the exam without uh, any kids. And I think that, you know, what I'm beginning to understand is that it's very hard and rightly so, you should always have your kids as your number one priority. And it's very hard to put the, you know, the exam as your number one priority and be able to gain the time to actually get um, you know, the experience to pass this exam. So I am absolutely in awe of you know, what you've achieved and your resilience absolutely amazes me. Um, and you know, many of you have actually reached out to me, you know, a number of you. And I can tell you, I'm absolutely heartbroken, absolutely emotional, and I share your pain. And I really want to do everything I can to help you pass. I, I'm going to be honest, I don't have all the answers. And I think that this is something that, uh, you know, I think with La, we want to explore and we hopefully want to come up with, you know, ideas in terms of how we can keep on getting better and keep on providing the support um, that I think hopefully will help you achieve success in this exam. And I'd really like to thank Sarah, um, Sarah Ritchie from New, New South Wales for coming here today to um, talk to us and share with us her experiences of being a mum and also being able to get through the primary exam as well. Excellent. And, and so, Sarah, before we get on to you, um, I thought I'd just outline a few things that I think uh, maybe a few assumptions and a few facts that, and things that Stan and I have both said about this exam. For example, I think one of the first things is there's probably more mums sitting in our experience. Uh, you know, again, this is just our small experience of um, being in a public hospital and seeing who's going through the exams. Well, when we were sitting, no one was a mum. Everyone was essentially, uh, you know, without children sitting their primary exam and maybe for the second part exam, they, they might have gone to that stage in life. So I think it's far more of an issue now that people do have children when they're sitting exams and maybe there's more grad. You know, I think when I was seeing everyone pretty much done undergrad med, uh, whereas nowadays everyone does, most people do post-grad med. So there's more mums sitting. Um, I think the fact is that the mums probably have a lower pass rate and there's a few groups out there that in a sense are you know, disadvantaged, I guess, or do have those challenges. So having those lower pass rates mean that there definitely is something that needs to be addressed and an aspect of you know, equality here that is really important to address. 
Um, but also the fact that, uh, you know, again, just from my experience, and this could be completely wrong, but I, I feel like in my experience, mums probably take on the burden of child, child raising and feel, you know, feel far more um, in terms of the yeah, making children their priority. Whereas again, just in my experience, I know that dads, I find, find it a lot easier to put work as a priority. Um, so you know, N equals whatever. <laughs> That's, if that's a real thing, I think that's really important to acknowledge as well. Um, and finally, I think uh, I have, you know, when I speak about this exam to all my trainees, I, on, I constantly say that this exam must be a priority and nothing else matters. Uh, and that's how I felt during the exam. I gave up everything to get through this exam because I just realized how hard it was and how much I'd need to sacrifice for this. But that's just not possible. And I feel like I probably need to you know, we, I think we all need to try to find a way around that. The fact that the exam is incredibly difficult uh, and can be difficult, but then there's there's a way there's a way through it, and there's a way we can find a solution in these circumstances where you know you have these challenges like being a mum. And when I, when I synthesize it, and hopefully this can be part of the discussion of solutions, but I feel like it really is a, a problem of time, and you know you've only got so many hours in the day, and a problem of flexibility of time because you know you know suddenly your kids or your family needs you you've got to be able to somehow manage that as well as prioritizing your study so time and flexibility i feel like are these really big and big issues that um if someone we could find answers for could make things a lot a lot a lot better um so the, hey stan do you want to add anything else to that before um we get on to sarah's experience no, I think you've covered it really well and, exp and explained it uh, really eloquently, uh, La. And I think that uh, we need, really need to hear from Sarah from her yeah. firsthand experience in terms of, you know, what she went through and how she found it. Beautiful, Sarah. So, yeah, welcome. Thanks so much for coming and sharing, you know, sharing with us and sharing your story. Um, if you could give us a bit of your background first and you know, when you got onto training and yeah, it's just what your experience was, and then we'll get into more detail hopefully about your experience of actually sitting the exam um, what are the challenges, any, any anecdotes you had about how you manage your time and you saw some of the solutions, resources, supports you came through. Hopefully we'll be able to get through a bit of that and maybe some of the aspects of how, you know, people could learn from experience, change, um, and maybe get even support from ANSCA and other bodies. Um, Sarah, welcome. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I feel like I'm very normal and undeserving of being talking to you all about my experience, which to me is just my life. Um, but I studied post-grad med, as I'm sure most of you guys have. And I have been an intern, was an intern resident, SRMO, and that's when I started having my kids. Um, so I had a baby as an intern, then I had a baby as an SRMO. So I, then I did my SRMO year in Crick Care down in sunny Wagga Wagga and did my first year of training down in Wagga, um, which is where I sat the primary for the first time last year in August. And then this year I moved to Sydney. I uh, got a job out at Nepean, which if any of you know Sydney, it's as far west as you can get before you hit the Blue Mountains. So it has its own challenges. Um, and then I sat the exam in um, March and May where I was successful. And it's been a week or 10 days and life's been very, very good. So I, I highly recommend life from the other side. It's so much better. So, yeah, that's my, that's my training story. Um, I'm 34. So, um, you know, I feel old, but I, because I have colleagues of mine who are my age and consultants and I'm a second year trainee, um, but that's okay. It's not a race. And I think that's really insightful, Sarah, the fact that uh, you said that you actually set the, you actually set the primary last year in August and didn't get through. And I almost think that it's almost a very common theme among among mums that uh, on their first attempt, that perhaps then they're, they're not quite ready yet and they need that bit of extra time um, to actually get through. Like, what was the difference, do you think, between the August and this sitting here? Yeah, so I definitely think that as a mum or as someone with that can't give their whole life, the thousand hours takes longer to get. So I think the extra six, I, when I sat last year, my mentality going in, because I was really unsure whether I should sit it or not, was on a good day I'll pass. Um, and I missed out on passing by two multiple choice questions. So I was close, um, but not close enough. And 
it's not going to be a good day. I think you have to acknowledge that it's a really stressful day. Last year, it was COVID lockdown. Um, I wasn't sure I was even sitting until the day before the exam because we couldn't go to Sydney or Canberra. Um, then New South Wales locked down, so I ended up sitting it in Wagga. Like there were so many pieces of the puzzle that made it a really bad day. Um, and I think in hindsight, my main advice to people who have kids is to, it takes longer than you think. And that extra six months gave me the confidence that when I started in May, uh, in March this year, that I just went in feeling like I knew my stuff and that there was nothing that they could ask me that I wasn't going to be able to write something about. Um, even Teg and Rotem, which I'd never seen and really didn't know a whole lot about, I still, you know, would have, I wrote something reasonable down. Um, and I think having that confidence that you can, you know, enough to get by is really powerful and it changes how you approach the exam on the day. And it changes how, it just changes your mindset. So that instead of, I went into the second time thinking that I'm going to pass on a bad day. And that really helped. No, fantastic. And, and altogether, you would say that you studied for 18 months? Yeah, 18 months. I mean, that's really, really insightful, I think. And I'm starting to wonder whether, you know, like the advice we should be giving for mums is that, perhaps, you know, with that balance, you, you do need to have that longer stretch. And I think La and I were having a chat about this before, about how the progression of time has changed, you know, since I guess when we were, when we were starting off, you know, people were saying nine months, and then now we're sort of saying 12 months, and perhaps now we should even be pushing it longer. Um, how, how, how did you manage work and study at the same time? Did you do, did you, were you still a full-time, um, still work full-time? Yeah, so I've always worked full time. Um, I want to get my training done while my kids are little because I figure they don't need me as much now. Anyone can cuddle. This is just my personal opinion. Lots of other people don't share this, but I figure um, anyone can cuddle them. Anyone can read them a story, but I want to be there when they're teenagers and older so I can help them and guide them through life. So that's just my philosophy. So I'd rather work really hard now so I can get all my training done by the time my eldest will be eight. Um, and then I can be there to help him out in life. So I've always worked full time and I don't intend to start working part time until I'm finished. Um, but I think for me, I chose to stay in Wagga to do an independent training year, which what well, New South Wales is a weird place for training which is a whole other issue but I chose to stay in Wagga and do a one year with a one year contract because for me even though I had no family there I had no commute time so I wasn't wasting time getting to work so for me that was an extra two hours a day that I could study um, I found that was really invaluable and this year I've gone to having an hour and a half commute each way to work so that's if people who are working in big cities with big commutes, like that just takes out so much of your working day. So I, I know that not everyone can move to the country and do a year of their training, but it, it worked for us really well. Um, Cause otherwise, you know, it just leaves such a burden on your days off. You just don't have the time. That's interesting. Like I say that because yeah, the commute time is definitely the time sink. Um, but then uh, the small town effect is some people, some small towns will have lots of, examine uh, type uh, consultants ready to give you first part teaching and others won't was Wagga particularly good with first part teaching um yes I think it was at, you know I think in when you're in a place and it's the only place you've worked you're like oh I don't know what how to compare but it actually was quite good um, especially when it came to vivas because I was at a new hospital and had been in such exam mode um, I didn't really know many consultants at my new hospital to ask and I didn't know really anyone because I'd only been there for a few months. So um, all of my Wagga bosses gave me vivas and were more than happy to, even though they said, oh, well, we're not very good at this, but I mean, everyone can read and they just read them and they were fantastic. And I really um, appreciate that they're still supporting me and helping me when they really don't have to. It really just sounds like where whatever the challenges are, you've got this strong community of people who want to you know, help out, mentors, and all the rest of it. It that just, uh, I mean, we see it, we see it time and time again that that seems to take out a whole bunch of the you know the burden and the difficulties 
just because you've got people to support you. So, yeah. Yeah, I would say definitely. And I think um, this is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. And as a mum or like I have the most amazing husband um, and I really would not have been able to do this without him. He allowed me to as single-mindedly as I could focus on this exam and it, it doesn't need to be your husband it can be your mum or a friend or if you have no family and you're a single mum someone you pay but you you cannot do this by yourself you have too many balls to juggle like basically in the lead up to the exam this first time um, my mum was taking my husband took long service leave my mum took long service leave and then couldn't come to help because she got locked down in Sydney um, so I just had people who were giving up their time for me and that's really amazing that someone would do that even though I know that they love me they don't have to do that mm -hmm. that's a massive ask for them like we could have gone on a holiday but Duncan just decided to stay home in Wagga and mind our children for six weeks um, so I could not have done it without them and the second time around we actually moved to Sydney and we lived with my parents so I didn't cook a meal or do a load of washing, I think, in two months. Um, I would just work and study. And the exam was my main priority because I had already done it once. I did not want to do it again. And I was allowed to, I, selfish is, has negative connotations, but I was really selfish. I just focused on the exam. Um, I lived and breathed pharmacology, physiology and equipment. and. I think in the end, that's what you have to do. You have to, as mums and dads, um, we inherently try and put our kids first and, you know, we read them stories and we, we put them first, but you can't do that if you want to pass, which is sad, but I, I just personally, I can't see a way of being a really good mum, a really good doctor and passing the primary. Something has to give. Um, and I think that the more we acknowledge that, the easier it becomes for ourselves to realise that that it's okay. We, we're not going to be perfect and and we just have to do what we have to do to get through. And just from what you said, how, first of all, how do you have that conversation of, look, I've just got to be selfish for, you know, this many months or however much time I need to put this as a priority. How did you have that conversation? And also, what was your amount of children's time like I imagine you had to have some children's time how, how did you balance the amount like was it very regimented or yeah um my kids are really good like they're five and three and the three-year-olds basically had mum studying for his whole life that he can remember <laughs> um and they just get used to it like they are really good for me this probably sounds a bit weird but um we used to have showers together so I would come home from work, the kids would be fed. I'd supervise them while they had a bath. And that was family time. That was my time. And then my husband would put them to bed and I would study. So that was something that worked really well. Um, or I would read them a book or, but it was quite small chunks. Um, on the weekends or when I had a day off, I would um, study in the morning. Uh, for four hours like Patsy Tremaine recommends so that was um, like unbreakable time from eight till 12 that I was and then I would like watch a movie with them or play blocks or whatever for a couple of hours in the middle of the day and then I would study again in the afternoon and they just got used to it and sometimes they would try and break down my door and be like quite annoying but most of the time and they just my husband would take them out of the house um and that's how we managed. Just to give a bit of um, context to that, Patsy Tremaine does a lot of performance coaching and she's a kind of elite sportsman turns like performance psychology, but she does advocate for the you know, best hours in the morning, 50 minutes, 10, 10, 50 minutes on, 10 minutes break times four for four hours in the morning. And then the afternoons are like just relax and um, you know, see your mates. And then evenings are for testing because you're going to be tired and you want to test while you're tired. So yeah, really kind of like that framework. That seems like a pretty pretty good framework to have. Mm -hmm. um, and so you were saying then uh, you had this, like in terms of amount of time with your kids, did you, uh, would you say it was an hour a day just to get to the nitty gritty of it? Uh, uh, it, it varied. So it might've been half an hour 
um, during the week. And then on the weekends, I would try and spend a little bit longer and it might be one to two hours of quality-ish time, as quality as you can. But yeah, it, it wasn't a huge amount. But now I've finished and I've spent the last 10 days with them because I've had annual leave and they don't care that I have ignored them for the last 18 months. They, we've gone to the beach, they give me hugs. We went out and had lunch today and one of them was sitting on my lap eating his chicken nuggets and I was like, oh, what are you doing there? And like, they just don't care. They, they are happy to have me back and it hasn't at this um, point impacted on our relationship at all. How, how did you have those conversations about what you need? Uh, I'm quite direct, as I think probably most of us anaesthetic trainees are because we have to be, especially the girls. Um, and I just said to my husband that this isn't forever um, and this is what I have to do. And he is very much, I think, an advocate and we need to take our male allies where we can because Otherwise, we're not going to get very far without, um, you know, the, our advocates and allies. And he was just said, "Oh, yeah, that's that's fine. You, if it makes you happy, off you go." So I'm I'm very lucky. I remember having a similar conversation uh, in the relationship I was in during my exams, and I, I just I, th- I just thought it was going to end really badly. I said, "Look, you know, I've got this thing. We just started seeing each other. I've got this big exam. I might not be able to see you more than you know once a week or whatever." I said. And they were just completely fine with that. Like, I was just surprised that all I needed to do was ask and outline the situation and it actually turned out a lot better than I thought it would be. So yeah, having, it, having those difficult conversations and asking for you isn't, isn't easy, but yeah, it's good, that, uh, it's good that the realization that you have, which was to be direct and you know, ask that. And I think also having it early. So when I came back from even before, specialist trainings I was an intern and I'd come back from mat leave and I was hating being back at work and it was all hard and I said to Duncan that I was just going to go and do GP because it seemed like a better option than the horrible ED rotation I was on and he said okay and then after a few weeks when I'd got back into the swing of it I thought no if I I do GP because that's what you want to do don't do GP because you think it's better than what you're doing and I said to him actually I don't want to do GP I think I want to at that stage, it was ICU. I was like, I think I want to do ICU. And, and he said, okay. And, and I said, you know, that's going to be hard. And he's like, that's, that's fine. We'll deal with it later. So I think having, and then ICU turned into anesthetics. Um, but I think having those conversations and being really open about, about the plan. And, and I think also remembering that training and consult, being a trainee and being a consultant is different. And I look at, the consultants um, that I've worked with and I, and I talk to them about their life. And, and I think it helps you to see the other side where from the like fog that you're in at the moment. Yeah. And so Sarah, um, you know, you, you've talked about open communication, you've talked about um, sacrifice and it's a really a collective commitment from all those around you. Um, and I was, I was wondering if you could, um, you know, look back in and, you know, go back about sort of, you know, six, six months ago, do you think you needed to sit the August exam and not pass to be in this position? Or, or do you think that uh, perhaps there was another, another way to sort of approach it? What, what are your thoughts about the whole process? That's a really interesting question. And one that I've thought about quite a lot, like, would I have had the same mindset going in this time if I didn't sit in August and I don't haven't really come to a good answer for me working somewhere where I had great consultants but I'd never been had a question marked by or spoken to an examiner so I found the feedback that I got for the short answer questions even though it was just a mark um, was really useful and I found that getting my marks for those short answer questions made me gave me the concrete knowledge that my answers didn't have to be perfect my answers didn't have to be like ketamine nightmares which is great but it's unrealistic for 10 minutes um so that I felt was really really useful and I'm not sure if I would have had that same confidence going in if I didn't know that so yeah was it worth a five grand practice run I don't know and it might backfire and I definitely had some um demons I think going in when I sat the second time I was like geez I do not want to have to do this again 
but it was a valuable experience. Did, did you change your, um, like your commitment or your approach? So, so going in from August, it sounds like, you know, you had everything sort of set into place, but then because you didn't get through, did you tweak anything from August to, to March? Because I know that a lot of mums here have had, are going through the same thing that you, that you went through a couple of months ago where they didn't get, now they haven't gone through this exam. Now they're trying to think about how to approach the next one in August. Uh, yes, I definitely did. Um, and I'm happy also if anyone has any questions, just ask them. Um, I really, so I gave myself a good break and then, which I think was valuable in not getting a viva because it gave me, I took a good two months off. I mean, I cried for about a week um, and then I took a good two months off and refreshed and completely recharged my batteries so I wasn't, didn't keep going. And then I really probably took another week and just looked at where I'd gone wrong. I talked to um, a few of my bosses who'd spoken, who'd sat twice and, and one of them gave me some really good advice, which was, he said to me, do you use highlighters and colored pens? And I said, yeah, of course. And he goes, throw them all away. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, it's passive learning, chuck them away. You just need to do active learning. And he said, I, I think I don't, I think he'd said it twice or three times. And he said, it was the first thing in his life he hadn't pass and excel that and he said you have to look at what you've done and you have to change and I was like oh yeah okay so I looked at what I'd done the first time and I made act, an active decision to change what I did so I did much more testing um, I did I thought I'd done enough multiple choice questions but I hadn't so I did not multiple choice questions till I couldn't look at them anymore um, I, I really evaluated my study and I did, I just changed, I did much more testing the second time around. Um, I also spoke, we had a group session with a sports psychologist through my work, which I found completely invaluable in changing my attitude. Um, and I highly recommend seeking professional help. And he, he said a few things that really resonated with me. And, um, one of them was, that that when you don't pass your exam or you don't achieve your goal you, there's a lot of fear behind that and I know that when the first time around I was really worried about letting everyone down um, I had so much pressure and I was worried about letting my partner my mum the boys myself I was just so frightened of letting everyone down and I sat my little boy down who was four and I said, look, mate, I'm so sorry, but mummy didn't pass her exam. So she's going to have to keep studying. And he just looked at me and said, but can we go make a cake? <laughs> and I was like, sure, we can go make a cake. My whole world's ended, but yeah, let's, let's go make a cake. So we went and made the cake and, and I was like, he actually doesn't care. Like he couldn't care less. And, um, and that was really a real revelation for me that like, they don't care. They, they really couldn't care at all. Um, so the pressure after that, I felt just a lot less pressure on myself because I went from feeling like the whole world expected me to pass to being like, just do it. What have you got to, and he had this, um, had worked with a lot of Olympic athletes and, and he had this said, you have to go in to the exam with like an empty mind and a mind that and he said, when you go in with an empty mind, you're dangerous because you then can let all the information come out. And so I worked on, um, I hope he doesn't hear this. So I've probably got it all wrong, but um, I worked on just trying to leave all that stuff behind and not worry about what everyone else was thinking and just really run my own race. And, and, and I felt the second time so much less pressure going into the exam. I've never, I've, never, I've never thought of that, that and like no one actually cares about this exam except, except you, like it, it matters to you, but you know, as long as you're a mom at the end to your kids, then whether you pass or fail, they probably don't matter at all. They, they don't care at all about, about your success or failure. Um. It was 
was pro- pretty heartbreaking, actually. <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, it was very humbling. <laughs> um, that's interesting. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so essentially, they they said to go in with an absolute, you know, empty mind, which means you don't worry about the outcome. You just do what you're doing, and that way you don't have all the extra stress of worrying about an outcome. And I think that's a yeah, that's a really important stra- strategy there. Were there were there any other kind of tips or you know solutions to the problems of being a mum that you know anyone has given you or the sports psychologist helped you with? I think a big one was um, just growing money out the problem. Mm. Uh, we make good money, uh, so outsource. We had a cleaner. I did HelloFresh. Um, the boys went to daycare or got a babysitter. And you just have to throw money at the problem until it goes away because usually there's a financial solution to all, you know, all of those things that make life boring, mundane and take your time and that time can be better served studying, unfortunately. I know washing sometimes seems more important and it's probably more exciting, but you just can't do it and you need to pay other people to to do those jobs for you. Um, I think at the end of the day, if you're a bit poorer because of it big deal um the exam costs five grand so if you take that into consideration and doing it again it's cheaper to get hello fresh mm-hmm. hey that's um, interesting i i i you know if, if we think of these problems as a problem of time and flexibility i, I completely agree and a big fan of outsourcing anything that i don't need to do um, and it, it's really good that you mentioned that. Can, can you list all the things you were able to outsource just again as tangible things that people can think about whether they're mums or not Uh, to create more time for yourself? So I think cooking is a big one that takes up a lot of time and mental load. So um, HelloFresh, Woolworths Online, Dinner Ladies, if people are in New South Wales, they're fantastic, highly recommend. Their food's delicious. Um, Definitely a cleaner. Mm -hmm. Uh, Actually, just on the um, food thing, one of my mates, he got really into the keto diet type fad. And he got someone on air tasker to make very prescriptive meals that were specifically keto for him. And it's very cheap is on air tasker as well. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's always a solution for whatever your dietary needs are. Some will, will be, can, will, will, you know, take your money to make it for you. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> uh, definitely a cleaner. And we, this went from fortnightly cleaner to weekly cleaner um, because it was just too hard. Uh, washing, and we tried to get someone to help with like washing and the folding of the washing, but unfortunately that was difficult where we lived. Um, so, but that is something I would definitely recommend because we had piles of washing that we just used to get our clothes out of. Um, daycare. So the boys were at full-time daycare, even though I worked a four day week um, and did lots of weekends and the days that I, wasn't at work they still went because I needed they were very precious days um and I also found a our next door neighbor who was in high school and she used to come over after school um and mind the boys uh from like four till six so on days preschool days where they finished early um I knew that she would she would look after them and then she would feed them and bath them and and that kind of thing. So I think um, in the city, there's probably some more options for help with washing and all that kind of thing. But that was what I found worked. But if I could have found more solutions, I would have. And I'm imagining that your partner, Duncan, he sorted out the daily finances and, you know, things like paying bills and, you know, all those other kind of organisational things that take money or even shopping for food. Uh, Is that safe to assume? Uh, I probably still took on the food, but I would do Woolies online and pick it up. Um, But he definitely took on the bill paying, the probably all of the other things that I can't even think of because I haven't done them in such a long time. Um, But he looks after, yeah, he's, he works in finance. So I've delegated that to him as his life job anyway. Um, But he would look after, and if there was a problem with the kids, um, he called in sick to work. So I'm, I'm very lucky that in our relationship, I would say he's the traditional female and I'm the male. And I know that sounds really sexist and isn't necessarily how society works anymore. But, um, yeah, his role was a lot more flexible than mine. 
and it allowed him the capacity to call in sick even on a day that I had off um, because he knew that that wasn't a day off, that was a study day and I was working on the weekend. So he might um, take the kids in the morning and then he would work in the afternoon. So it was really our family's priority that I passed. Yeah, a real team effort there. And, and when you tell me the, the story of you um, doing all these little things, like there's a really great story about the British cycling team and just that the fact that they never won a Tour de France or any kind of major competitions for decades. And this one coach came in and just, it was a story of incremental gains, just 1% improvements in multiple things, which is what you're kind of doing. You're just tackling all the little things that make up life and time and everything. And you're just slowly chipping it away to make it, you know, free yourself up from that time. So yeah, I think that's really exceptional. And probably something we could almost write a whole thing on just to help people through and find a whole bunch of resources so that people actively go and tick these points off to create more time and flexibility. Um, um, so I wanted to ask, do you think that, um, you know, your hospital or even ANSCA um, could provide some solutions or, or what do you think that um, would really help you or would have helped you, you know, in that eight, in those 18 months? Was there anything else that we can sort of improve on as an organization or even as a community, as a group of, um, yeah, group of specialists? That's a really good question. And I've had it been thinking about how we can make it easier because I know that, um, yeah, I've just anecdotally speaking to people that it does take people with kids a little bit longer. And I mean, we're just as smart. We just have a few more time can, things on our plate and how we could make it easier. I think that something I found really comforting was um, Medical Mums Facebook group, uh, just to know that I'm not particularly active on social media, but just knowing that there was lots of other people who had done what I was doing and I wasn't the first was a really comforting thought. Um, I managed to, through one of the Viva courses, the South Australian primary course, I linked up with a, a fellow tra trainee in Western Australia and um, we did some Viva practice and we both had kids. And, and I think it was just really comforting to know that you're not alone and um, there are other people like you, uh, was a really, was really comforting. And, and as well as that, having your allies. So I've already spoken about my husband, but, um, one of my really good close friends is an anesthetic trainee and she would send me gifts of suits, um, to pump me up and keep me on the right track. And I think it's just about, I don't know from an organizational perspective, what, what we can do, but I think from a personal level, you need to have a variety of people who are on your team um, and you need to find them and hold them really close. And, and I had a, a who would give me vivas at the um, when he'd finished, like he was happy to give me a viva at any time of the day or night, no matter what time I'd finished work or, and I think having those people who push you um, to pass and you to keep going when, you're really the chips are really down is really important but from an organizational level i'm not i don't know i haven't really well you know what maybe um we can actually facilitate a you know a specialist mums in anesthesia training group because i think um one of the things that i've sort of realized is that you know you talk about that commonality of cause and i think that's where a lot of people find their strength to to know that you know, someone like yourself has been through what they're going through right now. And I think a lot of, you know, a lot of mums out here are probably six months behind what you were, what you had gone through um, in August last year. And now they want to be able to sort of look forward and see you um, and see where you are at the moment. And that's where they want to see themselves. I think that will help. So, you know what, I think that we can, yeah, that's something that we can sort of work on and build upon. And you know, as Lars said, these are sort of incremental gains. And I think from, you know, building the building on these connections, we can sort of create ideas that hopefully um, can just make things better for, for moms out there. Hey, and Sarah, in the last few minutes, is there anything you would do differently? Uh, anything you would change? Yeah, I've been thinking about that too. Um, I don't think so. I think that at the end of the day, I've come through this exam with an intact family, which is 
is important and not something everyone who sits the exam can say. Um, and I'm happy. So I don't think so. Um, there's just one quote that I don't would like to, which helped me a lot, um, is what Quinton Bright, Dame Quinton Bryce, who was the Governor General, and she said that women can have it all, but they can't have it all at the same time. Uh, and I found that when I was really struggling, was like, yes, Sarah, you can do it, but you just can't be everything to everyone right now. So, um, yeah, we can do it, but you just need to be gentle and kind to yourself. Yeah. And I think that's a, I mean, there's so many good points. And I think as a preliminary discussion and hopefully something that we'll somehow continue to work on in the background and maybe just through all our different channels that we can find some kind of way to improve the quality and I think Sarah like you mentioned you were really lucky in this as well like having so many supports and a good team around you and everything like not everyone has them some if there's on if we could somehow get a way to have a bit of a plan a structure there's a lot of structures and um, a way of just uh, you know just equalizing this playing field for mums out there I think that'd be a really really good beneficial thing um, yeah uh, is it does it now we've come to the end of just I guess what Sarah is talking to us about but does anyone have any questions or wants to add anything at all please um write in the chat or just uh, un 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 unmute yourself you guys are going to be the next leaders um and the next drivers of the next change and to be order in order to actually drive that change you have to be you know in that position right now where you're going to struggle through it you're going to be able to have to encounter those challenges those difficulties those things that make it as Sarah said, the Mount Everest challenge, you guys are going to have to climb that to, you know, to the top and pass. And then from those, from that position, you're going to be able to create opportunities, you know, for others and really, I guess, normalize yeah. um, what I think is happening. It's growing. It's I think we have to recognize that, you know, mums in, in specialist training is becoming more and more. Um, yeah. And we need, as an organization to be able to facilitate that and to support that. So, you know, it's, you, you, you guys are the trailblazers and our, and Lara and I, you know, we, we, we want to do everything that we can to, to get you guys through. And um, Julia, I can have a hand up before, uh, but also yeah. just don't worry, don't worry about, just put you, just, just Sorry. speak up yeah. if you want as well. So, thanks, Julia. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sarah. That was really good. And I found myself getting teary too, <laughs> listening. And um, I, yeah, I, I, I would, I, I would like some sort of, I don't know how to deal with Nan's curve. I've got this horrible fear in the back of my head that they're going to come along and tap me on the shoulder and say, you're not trying hard enough, you're out. And um, I, I wish that there was a uh, some sort of um, channel to get to the, the college to just find out about options or, you know, um, if there's any way to extend training time or, um, yeah, it's something that's been on my mind. Um, but it's very admirable what you've done, Sarah, because I've had a lot of trouble with the, um, I guess, petitioning of my life and trying to, I, I've really struggled with the prioritising study. And I think from when I started training, and I've been training since 2019, the end of 2019, I've, sorry, <laughs> it's my child. Um, I... Um, I, I sort of thought I, I can't actually prioritise study. There's just not enough time. And I'm, I've now come to the realisation I have to prioritise study. Um, and it's very difficult to actually petition things to get it happen. But These are all things that we can, that we, there's definitely a way, a way around this and definitely a way to make people see the light because, you know, un, until people speak out and people advocate, then really change, change isn't going to happen. And it's, it's, it's just really, it's just really important that we, we talk about this now because you're, you're really going to be trailblazing and advocating for every, all the hundreds and thousands of mums who are going to sit through this exam and go through what you've got, you guys have already been through in the future. So um, does anyone else have anything to add? We've got, we've, you know, we've got all the time in the world really. So feel, feel free. Um, we're going to have an, the next session with, uh, Jen Norman and that session there is probably a lot more um, you know she's been through a lot she's been through training since I started I think just a year after I started from 2016 so um, 
that one there is even more emotional and, and uh, that um, that session won't be recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, she, that, that invites just for mums only. So if, you know, you're a mum and you still got a bit of time, please come to that, you know, come and join and, and hear her story. Um, but I just want to, but before, I mean, before I head off to the, to the next one, I just want to thank Sarah, you know, thank you so much for coming on. You know, it's, as I said, as you, you know, you've, you've succeeded and I want you to continue on and, and remember this because you are, you know, we want you to be a champion for all, for all the mums out there and, you know, be a, be a voice of change and a voice of continual evolution in terms of, I think what we deliver as a specialty to look after those that are that are there and you know thank you so much Sarah. as i said amazing achievement and i'm completely in awe with what you've what you've done thank you for having me and i'm happy um to talk with any of you guys and pump you up and send you gifts and um because sometimes you need that but we can all do it you can do it like i am just the same as you guys so we can do it you just you can get there. Thanks so much for everyone being on this, uh, especially for all of your experiences that you're sharing. Um, so that we might conclude it there while we head off to the next session. Um, thanks very much for watching and listening and really, really hope this is helpful for anyone out there going through what we're, you know, that you're, you, you're all going through at this point. And yeah, we, we just really hope that this could be the start of a whole change in the process and whole change in the curriculum and, and, and the way we sit the exam and the way we think about, you know, people in very specific situations that need special consideration and a, just a different way of thinking about the exam and getting through it. So we'll close on that and we'll, yeah, thanks very much everyone and we'll see you next time.